All right. Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome. Just letting a few into the meeting room now. This is our last uh, webinar presentation, as we mentioned previously. We've been doing this for five weeks and covered quite a lot of ground and a lot of topics and really appreciate your time in, in joining us. Uh, today we're covering uh, shockcrete materials and equipment. Greg Cedars will be presenting on that. I might hand over to Greg now and um, he will take us away with a presentation on shockcrete and mortise. Thank you. All right, thank you, Daniel. And uh, like Daniel said, welcome to our, our very last webinar for this five week series. So it's been a lot of work, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, and I think we've connected with a lot of people uh, in and around the world uh, over these five weeks, which has been a good little learning experience for everyone. So what I'll cover today is shockcrete materials and equipment. What is shockcrete? Shockcrete is a generic name for cement, sand and fine aggregate concrete, uh, which is applied pneumatically um, and compacted under very high velocity against your wall or your surface that you're spraying against. There are two classifications of shockcrete. There's dry spray and there's wet spray. Uh, and when we're talking about wet spray, we're talking about wet spray concrete, not wet spray mortar uh, in the most instances. A little bit of history for, for shockcrete. It was invented in 1907 by Carl Ackley uh, in the US, uh, which is the very first dry spray machine. Um, in the 1950s is when wet mix shockcrete was introduced. Um, also, it was firstly introduced into Australia in the 1950s uh, with wet spray and dry spray. Uh, and one of the very early applications was in the 1960s for the Snowy Hydro, Hydro Scheme, uh, where they used to spray concrete with tunnel lining. Uh, now, with Snowy Hydro 2.0 starting up this year in Australia, um, there'll be thousands more cubic metres of shockcrete sprayed over that project life. Now, what is dry spray shockcrete and wet spray shockcrete, the differences between the two? So dry spray is pre-blended materials which are fed into a hopper uh, with continuous agitation. Uh, the materials can be slightly pre-dampened to reduce your dust uh, on the application. Then compressed air is introduced to convey the materials through the hose uh, to the nozzle where water is added uh, for your mixing element. Uh, material is consolidated by high impact velocity against your wall. So this is just showing the, the basic operations of the dry spray equipment uh, and I'll go into the different types of equipment uh, in the coming slides. Uh, so what you have, you have material being fed into your hopper with the agitation in, in the hopper uh, and then air is fed through the bottom section of the, the mixer there, uh, through your hose uh, and your water is added at your nozzle, like we talked about. So advantages of dry spray. So it's a very easy start up and shut down and clean up. Uh, because you, you're dealing with dry materials, there's no mixing, uh, so there's no clean up, no wash out. Uh, you've only got to clean out your gun at the end of the day. Um, your control of materials on the site is very, very good because uh, it's all coming pre-packaged uh, and pre-blended, so there's no mixing on site. Uh, and the product can be pumped long distances, both vertically and horizontally, unlike wet sprays, which are limited in their, in their distances they can pump. So wet spray concrete, um, not wet spray mortar, so all the ingredients, including the water, are thoroughly mixed and introduced to the shock creep pump. So generally they'll come in the back of a concrete edgy, delivered to site, uh, so all your, your water ratios, your aggregates are already in there, ready to go. Um, and then the wet material is pumped to the nozzle where compressed air is introduced uh, to provide your high velocity. Where a dry spray, all your materials are coming in dry and waters uh, at the nozzle. Uh, with the wet spray, you're introducing the, the air at the nozzle. So wet spray shot creep is done with pre-mixed mortar or small aggregate concrete. And this is just showing you know, the two operations there. So you've got your big ready mix truck, which will deliver your wet spray concrete into a concrete pump or shock rate pump, uh, and then having your air at the lines at the, at the nozzle to create your velocity. Uh, the image here on your there, that's where you'll be doing a wet spray mortar. So which will be a pre-bagged um, mortar, which will be mixed and pumped through the lines and then air again to purge it. So advantages of, of wet spray concrete, uh, it's little or no form of physical pride. It's a very cost-effective method for placing concrete over large areas. Uh, it's very versatile, ideal for irregular shapes and surfaces, overhead applications, um, and some very unique bits of work that can be done with a wet spray shock creep. It allows for easier material handling areas with difficult access compared to doing uh, a form and pour concrete. 
So this is just goes into a bit more detail of the differences between a dry and wet spray concrete. Um, so with the equipment, you've got a, a lower maintenance cost when you're looking at a wet spray concrete, um, but a higher capital cost um, in the equipment. Where the dry spray materials, the machines that need a lot of maintenance because you've got dry materials going through the, the machines, um, but a very low capital cost. So you can have more equipment to do the work. Mixing, uh, you get very accurate mixing because it's coming from a batch plant with your wet spray. Uh, and can be used, utilised bulk premix. Now, with a dry spray, like we talked about, you've got your mixing at your job site, um, your batch planet and premix mortars can be delivered in bulk um, dry, but it, it's a lot harder to control. Um, your output, so with a wet spray, you've got a moderate to very high placement rate of three to 10 cubes per hour. Uh, and you can go up to 25 cubes if you're doing robotic spraying. So with a dry spray, it's very low to moderate, about one to five cubic metres an hour. Uh, so it's a very small output. With a wet spray, you'll have a, generally a lower rebound, typically between five to 15%. Um, and with the dry spray, we're talking 30%, depending on the product and applicator. We'll go into that with your product selection later on when a lot of that can be reduced down uh, to very low with a dry spray, depending on the product you're using, the mix design, uh, and your nozzle person will have a big impact on that application. So with the comparison there again. So with the dust, because being wet mix, there's no powder uh, to create dust. Um, and with a dry mix, it's notably higher. There's been a lot of advancements over the years in the equipment, uh, the nozzles, and the product themselves to reduce this dust uh, with your dry spray. So they are very negligible these days uh, compared to, but again, compared to a wet spray where there's no dry powder, uh, the wet spray has very no dust at all. So in place quality, it's very consistent with a wet spray because it's already been pre-mixed and blended. Um, can be variable with a dry spray because you're having your water added at your nozzle and it's a manual operation. So with your pumping distances, uh, a wet spray is very limited to how far you can pump. Um, it's like concrete. Uh, you can only pump about 100 metres unless you're using very special lines and, and equipment are used. Uh, where comparing to a dry spray, you can go 500 metres or greater. Um, the longest I've seen the dry spray being pumped at the moment is about a kilometre down into these sewer applications. So, and for typical applications, the wet spray shock crate is designed for high application volumes uh, to replace your formal pour concrete onto slope stabilities and all those sort of applications. Where if you dry mix, it's suited for low volume, stop start operations, limited access, remote access locations. Uh, so when we're talking about start stop, you're looking at concrete repair under wharfs, uh, and I'll cover a couple of these projects later on today, so you get an understanding of the, the, the right environment for a dry spray. So we'll cover across the equipment here now at the moment. Um, so with the dry spray, there are two types of dry spray shock crate equipment. You have a single or double chamber machines uh, and you have continuous feed machines. So with the single and double chamber, uh, these are intermittent operations. So they're putting in the, on a single chamber material into the chamber, which gets pressurized and pumped. And then you have to repeat the operation again. Uh, a double chamber allows for a continuous operation. Uh, and these are used for when you're doing your long distance pumping. Um, these are the type of equipment that the guys will use to pump up to a kilometre. So your rotary machines, there's two types of rotary machines. You've got your rotary barrel machines um, and then you have a rotary feed bowl. Uh, so the image on the right hand side there is your rotary feed bowl. Uh, and these are the most common two machines that will be used for dry spray shock reach on the market. Both use gravity feed uh, for the material, so the material will be dropped in. These have your continuous agitation running around your bowls. And these are your wear pads. So what will happen, the product will feed through the, the wear pads into your feed bowl, where the air is operated into there to feed it out your lines, uh, and then water out at your nozzle. So your wet spray equipment, uh, they can be defined as a positive displacement or pneumatic feed machines. Positive displacements make up the majority of the equipment used in the industry. Um, and there's two types of positive displacements. You've got your, hold, your hydraulic piston pumps uh, or your squeeze pumps. So your image on your right hand side there show your top one is your squeeze pump. This will deliver a, a lot more consistent uh, pressure of material to the, to the nozzle. Uh, where your piston, depending on your mix designs and, and your operation of your, your equipment, uh, can be surging because you're using your pistons to deliver the material. So the application of the, so now we're moving into applying the shock onto the base, what you need, uh, and the little techniques basics for applying shock 
so this is just the basics. You need the power, you need water, ventilation if you're doing a dry spray into a basement uh, underneath walls, so you make sure you've got good ventilation. Having the right amount of compressed air for both your wet spray and your dry spray to deliver the materials. And then training operator uh, is probably the key element for a quality finish in, in shock creep for either wet or dry spray. Um, probably even more critical on a, on a dry spray to get the water levels right, uh, the compaction right, uh, and a quality finish. And then safety, of course, having the right safety equipment uh, and PPE for the operators. So spraying techniques, the distance of the nozzle to the face should be 0.6 to 1, a little bit over 1 depending on the velocity uh, and, and the product itself. So the optimum distance is influenced by the aggregate size, your grading curve of your product and the air pressure and the speed of delivery. Um, the nozzle should always be perpendicular to the face at all times uh, and we'll cover reasons why this is the case. Um, and once you're spraying, you, you manipulate the nozzle in a circle to oval shape, as you can see there on the image on your right hand side, uh, rotating your nozzle there so you get good compaction uh, and coverage in and around your, your steel reinforcement. Um, with the application, you should always commence from the ground and move upwards um, and don't so never start from the top and move down, you're, you're never going to hold up the product. Um, on the right hand side there, this is where we talked about previously with your, your nozzle being perpendicular to your face. Uh, and this is another reason why. If you have it facing on an angle, a 45 degree angle, you'll get extreme rebound of your product. Uh, even on a slight angle, you'll get a higher rebound than having it directly perpendicular to your face. And this considers for both on a vertical and overhead operation. Uh, and with rebound, the skill of the operator uh, can have an even bigger influence as well. Your mix design of your product, how far away you are, the type of equipment uh, in, your, in your nozzles that you're utilising. A little bit of troubleshooting and some testing that gets carried out for your, your shock creep. So with high rebound, um, there's, there's quite a few reasons that can cause this like we've talked about. The velocity is too high or too low of your material delivery. Um, your water pressure again, if that's too low, then you're getting a lot of powder uh, and no water. So it's not gonna hydrate the material. It's not gonna stick to the wall. It's gonna fall on the ground. Uh, and then again, like we talked about, the angle of the spray. Uh, if you have the wrong angle, it's just gonna be bouncing off and, and, and going onto the floor. So with the incorrect slump of a, of a dry spray shock creep, means you've got way too much water in there. Uh, it won't hold up, it'll just be running down and, and very poor quality product. Uh, if you're getting very poor compaction, again, you're gonna not, not have enough water uh, or velocity in your delivery of your material to guarantee you've got the good product on the wall. So some little troubleshooting. So for a one inch airline using a dry spray shock crete, uh, generally 100 CFM air pressure is required to convey the material through the line. Uh, the bigger the line, the more the pressure. So go to a one and a half inch, you almost double, you, you pretty much double your amount of air pressure you need to deliver your materials. And water pressure for your mixing of your product, you're generally looking at 90 to around 120 PSI for your water at your nozzle to give you good hydration and delivery and eliminate your dust on your delivery of your product. Uh, it's good to use water booster pumps to generate high pressure of your water. If you're just using water from the tap, you can get surges uh, and loss of pressure of your water, which will then affect your water pressure at your, at your nozzle. Uh, then it's going to give you more dust, less compaction, uh, and cause those issues uh, on site. So with dust, there's a few issues with the dust. Um, you can either have dust at the bowl, as you can see there on your right-hand side. Uh, and what can be causing this is one, your mix design of your product, uh, also for your wearing pads within the, the mixture itself. If they're not aligned properly or they're wearing out, uh, this will cause the dust at the, at the hopper. And if you're getting dust at the nozzle, uh, then one is not gonna have enough water or too much uh, product getting delivered there to the, to the face, uh, causing the dust on the product. So testing, uh, test panels are for compaction and strength are done at the start of the project before you start spraying onto the walls. You can see the images on your right hand side there. They're usually a one by one meter box uh, and 200 mil thick. So what will happen, you have your reinforcement as you'll have on your project. They have them on a slight angle uh, to be able to spray them. You can check for compaction around those reinforcements, take calls for your strengths uh, and the likes. You can also take in situ calls from your, from your elements as well to get you in situ performance. Uh, it's also a good way to check your water ratio that your nozzle Nozzle training is working uh, and you're getting quality products on the wall. 
Uh, other test methods are around, around test panel. Uh, these are generally for a wet spray concrete mix. Uh, and then there's adhesion testing. So this should be done by calls on site uh, to check you getting the correct adhesion of your product. So product selection. So this is more around your dry spray shot creek. Uh, so high quality dry spray shot creek uh, is made up of graded aggregates, including your particle shape. Uh, so this will have a big impact on when you rebound your dust of your product performance, uh, you, but your particle shape and size has an impact on your wear equipment as well. So if you've got a very angular product or aggregate in your mix design, it will, it will cause a lot of wear and tear on your hoses. Instead of getting 20 ton value out of your hoses, you can have them wearing out in one to two tons, uh, which then adds a lot of cost to your, your equipment materials. So it also has a big impact on your high, high compacted, your dense final water, having the right mix design. Ultra low shrinkage and volume stability. Uh, so this is for your, when you're utilizing a dry spray shock creek for concrete repair uh, in your marine environments, uh, you gotta make sure you've got all these sort of elements in place so you have a quality product. Uh, and available, having the right mix design graded aggregates allows to have very high build in one pass. So I'll show you, this is a photo of a, or a bit of a video showing a good quality dry spray. So very little rebound there. You can see there's no dust at the end of the nozzle um, and an easy quick build up of your product. So other aspects to look for from a high quality dry spray shot crit, uh, low chloride permeability for your marine applications. Uh, so you don't get any ingress of Lawrence. If you're actually repairing shot crete uh, or concrete on a marine structure, you want to make sure you're putting, you're replacing better than what was there to start with. So let, low electrical resistivity uh, when you're doing impressed currents. Uh, this was covered previously by a, a webinar from Daniel um, a, a little while ago about your repair mortars and the lights. Uh, modulus compatibility with your host concrete. Um, you've got to make sure that when you're choosing a, a shot creek to do your concrete repair, that the modulus of the repair material is very similar to your modulus of your host concrete. And then again, uh, a, as a result of all the other elements we've just looked at, this will give you a high compressive strength and high flexural properties. Uh, and it's going to give you a good product at the end of the day. So just covering now coming towards the end, some project applications. Uh, so these are some applications that we've utilised our dry spray shot creek for doing marine and port upgrades. Uh, so Appleton Dock was a, one of the early projects we carried out with our HB55. A lot of under deck repairs there. There was about 800 tonne of shot creek that was applied. Uh, very limited access. You can see there the guy standing up there. That's good access for that one. Most of the time they're working from their knees to be able to spray the shot creek in there. So rebound on a job like this, we're getting down to five to 10% in these applications, which is very critical when you're working underneath a, a wharf like this, the less it goes on the ground, the less you have to pick up, uh, the less chance of getting product into the water as well. So web dock was a, a follow on the next project after doing the Appleton dock in Melbourne. Um, again, a very large project doing very similar applications underneath the wharf there. So you can see the image on your left hand side is the scale of the, the repairs all the way along that, that, that dock there. Um, again, this one was about 500 cubic, 500 tonne of shot grade application. Uh, other types of applications, silo repair. This is a, a cement silo in, in New Zealand uh, that was done. There was, I think there was four silos that were, concrete repair was done on, on them. Uh, overall, about 160 tonne of product was used to, to reinstate the, the performance of the, the silo. So you can see them breaking out the effective concrete uh, and then replacing again with the, the shock rate on there. And a very common application is uh, rebuilding sewer applications as structural repair in, in the sewers. Um, not the nicest environment to be working in, um, but again, we're very critical to have a high performance dry spray shock rate in these environments. Um, the less it falls into the sewer, the less you have to then clean up um, and get back at it and demark after you've done your application. So. This is the new sewer re refurb project, which is an ongoing 25 year program um, that's been carried out. Our shock has been used on a couple of sections there uh, up to about oh, 80,000 bags of dry spray product before they then put the acid resistant coating over the top. So you can see what they started with before they started cleaning out the sewers uh, to the application and then your right hand side there is the finished product um, in the sewer.
and then some jetty repairs. Uh, again, you can see different applications uh, that you can apply for your, your dry spray shop creeks. Uh, that one there was getting built out about 200 million in one single pass application uh, for a jetty repair in, in Queensland. And that's the end of our, our dry spray shop route. Uh, if you've got any questions there, you've got my email address down the bottom. Uh, you can, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself now and ask a question or feel free to put into the chat line there and we can answer your questions for you. Thank you. Um, Greg, Greg, Celia here from Quick Seal. Um, I have two questions. Um, you have a slide showing the application of the dry spray. And is water booster pump a uh, must uh, when you do a dry spray on site? What happens if we do not have a water booster pump and uh, they're just drawing water from a tank? Is it sufficient? Um, that's a good question. It, it, is, it can be sufficient, um, but the, the advantage of having the water booster pump is that you're going to have the consistent pressure of water. Um, where if you're drawing it just from gravity or out of a tap, uh, if you start to drop pressure, then you're always going to be adjusting your, your water at the nozzle. So you can have inconsistent quality when you're doing your delivery, which can then increase your dust, your compaction rate, uh, and also your rebound at your, at your base. So having a water booster pump is a very simple way to eliminate any issues of water pressure. It's okay, not, thank you. not a necessity, but it does improve your quality of your product. So uh, for a very small cost, um, it'll eliminate a lot of issues. Okay, and the second question I have is, um, in the sewer rehab project, what is the diameter of the pump? Um, they, they vary. Um, the news project, I think, was a, a four metre diameter pipe, um, but they can go down to, I think, three and a half, three metres, so depending on the sewer application. So a lot of them are working from pontoons, in there in, in live flow um, so you can see if I go back to that image there you can see on the left hand side there the, 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 the sewers are live um, but they're just doing them at low flow zone so it's a very hard environment to work in um, and not a very nice one to work in as well. Okay thank you. Thank you Celia. So again, thank you very much for your support over the last five weeks. We really do appreciate it. We hope you've enjoyed the series and just because we're not doing webinars doesn't mean we're not gonna be here anymore. So we're still always here for you. If you want a private webinar or you want us to present something in particular, please, please just ask. Uh, we're more than keen to do that whenever there is interest there. So look forward to seeing you again soon when we can all travel and um, and hopefully we can um, we can meet face to face sometime. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone.